to moderate the colleagues if the fight will start, but hopefully we'll finish peacefully. Yes, Gediminas. Thank Hello. you, Vito uh, Tess. I'm Gediminas Misaucius, uh, Open Banking Partnership Manager in Swedbank. And uh, I'm here also to, to tell that uh, banks are not uh, uh, having the walls anymore and uh, also want to col collaborate uh, with uh, uh, third parties. And uh, actually, we were inspired by PSD2 that we will need to open some sort of some part of, uh, of customer data um, uh, and payment initiations, of course, with customer uh, agreement consent. But uh, uh, that really inspires uh, improve customer experience by integrating more solutions because banks ourselves we cannot do everything and uh, and uh, we really believe into that in that thank you Gediminas. Alex okay so uh, I'm Alex uh, I'll answer the questions in reverse order so I'm here to hear your fantastic questions so I think uh, that's that's why I'm here this evening it's gonna be interesting to hear what uh, what you have to ask from from the audience uh, my experience is in uh, various roles in the private sector, in the public sector, and in the non-profit sector. But I've spent uh, 10 years in, in banking in the, in the Baltics. And now currently I am a portfolio entrepreneur. So I have a range of uh, companies and investments uh, in fintech, in machine learning with accounting, in e-commerce, uh, and with a hybrid uh, startup accelerator and, uh, and fund as well. So uh, sort of fairly broad range of, of hats to wear. Thank That's you, it. Alex. How many, how many startups currently in your portfolio? Uh, around 10. 10. Yeah. How many of them are fintech startups? Uh, three of them, I think. Three of them. Yeah. Are they Lithuanian startups? Uh, not all of them. Out of three, how many? Easy to calculate. Uh, <laughs> uh, one of them out of three is, is Lithuanian based, yeah. Okay. Is a, is a Lithuanian entity. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So the first question goes to Gediminas. Gediminas, um, from the bank perspective, how do you find current cooperation between banks and startups? Does that meet your success criteria? Uh, yeah, uh, if we look uh, in Baltics and Sweden, let's say Swedbank is operating in four um, uh, countries and um, it's currently much more cooperations are ongoing in Sweden and in uh, Lithuania we uh, don't have that uh, many examples, and there are some uh, s uh, some discussions uh, with some some uh, possible partners that uh, that that uh, I cannot disclose. But uh, uh, the the maturity level of this opening and uh, and uh, cooperating with fintechs also it's much much higher and bigger in Sweden. That's coming to Lithuania. In some cases, we also. Uh, really think that it's not necessarily a good idea to cooperate on some some uh, some areas and sometimes better to do ourselves but i think that you know uh, um, we really need to spend so much time with the compliance and uh, legacy stuff and uh, it's uh, not so much time actually to do some innovations and start startups really have uh, lots of good ideas and uh, things that they can uh, they can do it really quickly and then with the help of bank uh, later on scale up uh, solutions. And uh, also we launched a year ago Sandbox and uh, uh, the area, the, the technical Sandbox, it's uh, uh, sort of PSD2 API but with uh, some uh, static data that uh, um, startups can register there and test uh, functionalities. and. Uh, we have 1,600 uh, registrations there, and uh, around 10% currently is from Lithuania. It's actually hard to tell how much from Lithuania because uh, we don't have any field of country, and uh, but we can guess from emails, from names, and something like that. So, and uh, active uh, testers in that sandbox is around around 1,000 uh, users there. All right, thank you, Gediminas. So we have mentioned the regulatory constraints, being a bank and opening a sandbox, trying to get the innovations on board it, uh, on, on, you know, on corporate frameworks, infrastructures and technologies. So from the regulatory perspective, if you could change three things in regulations that would help you to onboard innovation at Swedbank, what would you do? 
Yeah, uh, actually, uh, one thing that is already a good initiative by Central Bank that's already launched from 15th of October, I think, uh, that uh, everybody, fintechs, and I, and I think also banks can apply for uh, a regulatory sandbox, um, uh, how to say? Opportunity. To opportunity to try out uh, some new solution, new product, and... Um, and that uh, test, in case test needs to be done in a live environment with real data, and the uh, regulator, Central Bank of uh, Lithuania, would not, uh, how to say, it's kind of six months or up to 12 months, some period that it's not like punished or so. But actually, still, we need to look into that very carefully. Still, we need to be compliant. That's really important for us because we are risking much more than uh, startups are risking. So. And uh, it would be good that attitude towards startup and uh, and bank to uh, to try out some new product would be same for both so for all market players. So one of the things that Bank of Lithuania already doing is to open the regulatory sandbox for the fintech startups to actually rehearse the ambiguity of the regulation. So still, I'm coming back to the question: What would you? Change, somebody is talking. Would you like to have a Skype call with us, all of us? Is that the question from the audience? Just let us know. That's okay to interrupt if you want. That's not a problem if you have any questions. We were planning to have one hour panel discussion and 30 minutes for Q&A in the end. But just in case you have a question that is burning in your chest, let me know, all right? So back to the question. What would you change? If you would be the one, you have a magic stick, regulation, as a bank, you have to follow, I'm not going to disclose how many regulations fintech startup has to pass to be onboarded at Barclays, uh, but it's quite a long list, I would say. And all the boxes to be clicked, it takes time. So what would you change? What would you think would make sense to accelerate onboarding innovations at corporation? I know I'm asking difficult questions, but that's my job. Okay, yeah, that's really a difficult uh, question. Actually, uh, this like open banking by itself already uh, brings opportunities to innovate. I mean, if uh, uh, some startup already developing and uh, already piloting some solution and they want to scale, and uh, yeah, it would be good from central bank also to, to look at these solutions um, uh, more softly, I mean, not so aggressive control and, uh, but still, I understand that also from, uh, we also, from the bank side, uh, uh, have a little fear that some, uh, some startups could really violate also some AML and uh, KYC stuff and uh, uh, that could bring um, negative, uh, uh, negative, uh, Impact. perception of a market in Lithuania, of, of financial market in Lithuania. So it can be some uh, side effects as well. Yes. So, so that we are afraid of as well. Thank you, Gediminas. I'm not going to ask more questions at this time. Vitotas, of course, we started talking about the regulations and the question for you. So from the regulatory perspective, launching the sandbox for the fintech startups, how many, I know that the de deadline is 15 of October, was 15 of October. How many fintech startups have you already had registered for that? So, as of today, we have already two. Two? Yeah, so just two. in one week. If so you could hold the microphone a little bit closer, yeah. because in the back people might not so hear one you. Of, one of them is from insurance. Okay. And the, the, the other one is like from, from payments or related to that. So I think it's quite, quite, quite good from, from the start. Uh, I, w I wouldn't say actually, yes, I agree that AML is, is a key risk for, for banks, but uh, I think we put the same requirements on everyone. And I, I think we put a lot of efforts actually in consulting those new guys, so I think Every week we have like two, three meetings with different ideas, different proposals, uh, whether this model w will work, whether we'll, can we do it this way. Sometimes even we s make suggestions, okay, you don't go that way, you, you should go the other way around and that will be fine with us. 
and we put a lot of effort actually like changing and improving regulation constantly as as we have more and more electronic money institutions, payment institutions, and even new banks coming. So we get very good feedback actually what, what are the problems for them. And I think we are quite successful and quite quick in just making those changes. Okay, thank you Vito Des and, and for the record that FCA, Financial Conduct Authority in UK, that's the, one of the strictest regulator in, in UK, uh, they have the feedback framework. So basically they issue on the new regulation consultation paper and then the um, market has a chance to provide feedback and then the second consultation, third, and then the final policy statement is out. So what is current feedback process or what, how is that happening between the startups and big banks in Lithuania and the uh, central bank as a regulator? We have something similar, I would say, but maybe not to that extent as UK FCA because they are like, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 people, whatever, we are 120. So we always consult the, ma the market. We always receive the feedback. And actually, if there is a need, we have physical meetings and so on. We don't do that very much publicly, I would say, because if we do that publicly, so we generally don't receive like public comments or something. So we just we send to the companies, to the associations, we receive feedback. So we, we do that. So there is a mechanism. Thank you so much. And just for the record, I just came back from Netherlands and when we were, we had a delegation on the startup ecosystem, one of the findings that Netherlands uh, RVO agency, basically the equivalent of Invest Lithuania, have shared feedback that Bank of Lithuania is very collaborative in Lithuania and very approachable, being as, as you have mentioned, 120 people for in such a difficult regulatory, now a lot of different things are happening in the regulatory space and new things are being developed like cryptocurrency and it, there are things that you do get some input from from the market and you have onboarded that. That's what already the other countries are, are sharing with us. So thank you on that. Question to Alex. Alex, to you. So you worked um, in SEB Bank. So one role in one shoes. Then you are co-founder and already, as you mentioned, in 10 different uh, startups. So another issues of being co-founder and a startup. And the third role that you have, you are the partner of Catalyst Ventures. So it's kind of the first hybrid of accelerator and investment program, isn't it? Could you share your perspective from different angles where we are in Lithuania with, you know, startup alliance uh, with the banks. Sure, <clears throat> I think it's uh, it's also interesting to reflect on uh, what what you've just said about the perception of Lithuania more generally, and how that's changed over the years. Um, I've been visiting Lithuania now for 20 years, over 20 years, and <clears throat> if I think back, sort of 20 years ago, people either didn't know where Lithuania was, or they had a uh, maybe only not very positive stories about uh, maybe criminality in the UK or, or other things that were happening. And then that changed with Lithuania joining the European Union. Then people started to know Lithuania. People started to say, yeah, I know someone who's Lithuanian or I've worked or met someone who's Lithuanian. Uh, and then, you know, 10 years later, or sorry, 10 years ago, I was still getting questions from people, you know, okay, so Lithuania, you still in Lithuania? Do people have mobile phones yet in Lithuania? Uh, so this was, you know, a little bit embarrassing that, you know, our, our reputation and image hadn't spread as far as I think we, we would have liked it to. And, and then for me, it was actually this summer, I was in London in June this year. And for the first time, I was sitting around a, a, a table, uh, actually in the old Bank of England, uh, in, uh, in the centre of London, and, uh, which is now a, a pub. Uh, and, uh, and it was a group of people. Uh, one guy was from Australia, working in a financial institution, uh, guys in startups, uh, guys in, uh, who are investors or in, in, uh, in, again, financial institutions. And it was the first time that I heard everybody around the table say something positive about Lithuania. That Lithuania is known for fintech, Lithuania is good at this, Lithuania has got fast broadband. 
And this was a really, really positive uh, shift in perception. So for me, that, you know, it took 20 years for that to come, but it's, uh, it's fantastic that that's really started to happen. So I think to hear when you, you go to the Netherlands and you hear these kind of uh, perceptions, I know that uh, Invest Lithuania and the Central Bank was in London recently uh, and got very, very positive feedback from some, some pretty important uh, major players as well, that you know, Lithuania is now a serious player and, uh, and the perception has changed. So sorry, that was a slightly longer story uh, going, going around it, but then the question was more from my, my different hats that I'm wearing and, and, and how have I seen that. Um, what challenges do you see? Let's, let's specify the question. So challenges as an investor, challenges as a startup, and yeah. when you worked, as far as I read your title, new products uh, yeah. director uh, in SAB Bank. So yeah. as a new product director, you probably have been interested in some startups, products that they have developing, and Ilya can talk on that more. Yeah. So Okay, so uh, I think simply in, the, in, in, in raising money for startups, there's still a significant gap in Lithuania of the sort of 500,000 to 2 million ticket size. That, that's, that's sort of fairly clear. Yes, there's some nice new money coming onto the market next year, so there are a lot of opportunities for, for those of you who are interested in, in starting, uh, starting new companies and, and getting some, some traction there. Um, and I think the startup ecosystem, Danielis, is, is much better a position to talk about the ecosystem, but I think it's really growing in terms of support and there's much more uh, you know, help and, uh, and guidance available there and encouragement, which is really important. Uh, then from the investor side, I think, um, you know, if you've got good ideas, it's not really the, uh, the, the, the problem with the money. It's, it's more just actually getting out there and making sure you get the right kind of finance that you need and matching, matching that finance with, with your needs. Um, and then from the bank side, I mean, it's two years ago since I left, uh, left the bank. Um, and my time was probably still just, just before the real cooperation with fintechs had, uh, had started. So I think, you know, again, Gedi Minis is maybe more, more positioned to talk on that. Um, but the challenges in terms of the alliance is, is still there, so. Thank you. I just picked up one of the messages, if you just uh, already heard, that it's a pub now. The, Did you say that the Bank of... Uh, yeah, the England. old Bank of England on Fleet Street is yes. now a, a bar. It's so, a bar. Uh, yeah, and, and, it was a, and it was a Lithuanian lady who was working there as well, so it was nice to see it. Perfect combination. <laughs> you see the collaboration somewhere is happening. Uh, on, in regards to that, uh, as you probably um, all seen, the headlines that the banks are going to disappear from the map, and so I'm just was wondering if we're going to have, instead of the, all the bank branches, we're going to have pubs in Lithuania with um, people working in there. So just, just the thought. Nice vision. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Alex. Elia, from, from your perspective, as a very challenging, challenger journey, Elia has approached 1,500 banks, 500 of them actively, and he will tell more story about that. So how is that going, collaboration with the banks? What is your product? So just to clarify, because Ilya is a RISE member in, in uh, our community, and of course we know about him, but if you could share just a little bit on your product that you're trying to collaborate with, with the banks. Um, actually, to be clear, maybe it's not like a collaborating, so we are not doing something together with the bank, but we are doing this uh, product for the bank and for the bank's clients. So uh, the challenger, good name for, 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 for challenging, uh, is a um, client engagement platform which activates customers to do more, learn more about products, try them, understand, learn, and, 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 and uh, improves financial literacy and uh, loyalty and so on and so on. So it's pretty big, big stuff. So it's not like a kind of plugin, but it's a big platform which, which, is, which should be installed. And um, thus we are, um, by approaching uh, the banks, we, we need to work closely with them as decision making is uh, usually taken on uh, C levels. And uh, our experiences are interesting actually. So, as you mentioned, yeah, we, we approached over a thousand banks uh, uh, from different angles. Um, many of them are actively, but uh, when we are talking about deployment uh, and the way uh, we can uh, run it in the bank, the, we see that decision making is pretty pretty slow. So, but this is natural. So, uh, when, as I know, some of you are from the bank, so you probably know how, how the process works. But for for those who are not working and actually are startups trying to think about 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 how to. Uh, 
work with banks, uh, it's uh, very, very conservative and uh, group decision making. I mean, and um, this is this is in short what what we're doing and what what, uh, what we work on. So, but uh, for sure, I can tell more if you specify some question more. Okay, so the question is, you have spent some time. How long did you spend to find the 1,500 banks, then 500 to approach, and how many, what is your success ratio? Uh, it took three years. Okay. Uh, I mean, we started three years ago. Uh, right now, we probably have you know, two or three or four, uh, depending on how we count it, uh, different clients okay. from the bank side. Uh, so the ratio, you can count it. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty small. Pretty small. And your target is? Retail banks. Okay. And how many would you like to have, uh, well, product sales for the bank? Like 10, 15, 150? Uh, I, I believe it's open question, so you will always want you know, to have them all, but it's for sure it's not, not possible. But uh, uh, when we started, we actually expected that it will be much faster and the rate would be uh, much, uh, I mean, much higher. Uh, I, I think, I think uh, that uh, sometimes a uh, question arises uh, why we, we, we were still working uh, with such small ratio and so on. But this is mostly related to the results from the bank we get. And even with uh, great results, we are connecting and uh, contacting the banks, showing them results. I mean, other banks uh, showing case studies and so on. Uh, but this, uh, very interesting, but this doesn't speed up the process. Okay, so what is the most common justification when you get no from the bank? What do you mean? When you, well, you approach the banks, then they go with, for the decision, they come back and say, you know what, Ilya, no. So what is the most common nice corporate language uh, phrase yeah, that the, you get? The, the, the language is always very, very great. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's all, also an advice for, for other startups. So when you get a uh, great, uh, great, great response, that cool, that's, 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 uh, that's, what, that's what we're, we're looking for for 10 years. And let's do that. Uh, let's go. Uh, this doesn't actually mean anything. So <laughs> these guys disappearing um, at some moment. And uh, what is interesting uh, and what we uh, get some finding from that is that actually uh, when these people are, I mean, first contacts and very, um, I mean, onboarded guys interested uh, are trying to sell this inside the bank, uh, it's usually the biggest problem here because uh, um, sometimes, um, maybe we'll talk later about the culture, but uh, we see that sometimes you have a high friction from different uh, departments, as we are w working with many different departments, uh, who are trying to, you know, to avoid any innovation. So they are, I mean, pretty okay with the things are going at the moment. Uh, and while they need to tell you that that's, uh, yeah, uh, to be polite, but actually there is still second thought uh, in, in, in the head and uh, you need to overcome these many issues uh, within the bank. So that's the problem, the biggest problem. Thank you so much. Um, just a comment on the English language, and when somebody says that this is a great idea, you shouldn't be thinking positive about that. Alex, could you comment, as a native speaking English, what are the common phrases used for the startups to understand that they actually eh, failed? N number, number one is definitely, it's very interesting. <laughs> If it's very interesting, <laughs> walk away and save your time. Very, very simple. Um, I, we had some English courses, and I remember somebody said from, from the teachers that if you get on the call, great idea. So I got some colleagues coming back, wow, you know, that's a great success, we already did it. And then nothing is happening. And actually, then I am, as a manager, getting a feedback, well, you know what? <clears throat> Don't even put in front of the investors these people because they really failed. I'm like, but you said the great idea. Yeah, but it's just the wording. And, and I think another one like that is, uh, you know, you approach, you approach a company and they say, yeah, really nice idea, not for us right now. We'll come back to you when, when we're ready to go to the next step. So then I think the natural reaction is you're sitting there waiting for them to call. That call is never going to come. So, uh, yeah, again, save your time. So uh, I never just, just a tip, tip for the audience and startups, uh, what phrase would give you an you know, indication that there might be a possibility and opportunity to work with these people? 
<laughs> I, can't, I can't think of, a, of a, the right answer for that okay. one, but that's one of the things I love about working in Lithuania is that everyone's very direct. So if they <laughs> like it, they'll say they like it. And if they don't, they'll say, no, I'm not interested. So is that okay in your British culture to ask when you're going to do your job? <laughs> you, can, you can ask the question, sure. <laughs> and the result might be not what I'm expecting to get an answer. I'm yeah. probably going to get ex escalation that I'm rude. Or block this email, never, never enter my inbox again. That sounds more, more realistic. Okay, got it. I just go, my mail, go, mail goes to junk right automatically. Thank you. Danielus, you have been, uh, actually, you're a co-founder, but not only from the startup perspective, you are the person that actually educating. You have created the platform on education and, well, growing, the, changing the mindset you have been consulting over 300 different startups. From your experience, could you share your insights? What is going on now between the banks and startups? Good and bad. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to say that there has never been a better time to start a startup. Maybe next year it will be even better. Uh, quite a few funds are launching. So if you want to get funded, now it's the time. It, it wasn't the case for so many years in Lithuania. I spent nine years uh, working with the ecosystem, starting in, with the first startup weekend, I think uh, eight, eight years ago. And since those days, uh, what I have witnessed is that those founders, those people that participated in those hackathons, most of them, or 80% of them, actually work in startups that they have co-founded or uh, joined. I think Vitilia, we met there eight years ago. So. Uh, People who participate in hackathons end up as founders when the uh, conditions are right and the conditions will be right for the next couple of years if the crisis doesn't hit us. But who knows? So um, regarding the uh, corporates or, or banks in specific um, collaborating with startups, it has never happened uh, so far. Yeah, well, there, there are some, at least in Lithuania or in our region, there are a few uh, examples, but I would say those are the exceptions. And uh, we are five years uh, behind uh, south of Europe and probably seven to eight years behind into the water to understand what is happening, can we collaborate with startups or not. And mostly this is like a marketing in initiative. But uh, can, we, can we see the real tangible results, the benefits uh, for both the fintech and the bank? I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, let's, let's see. So, uh, but the problem arises not, not from the fact that banks do not want to collaborate with startups. They do not know how, because mostly they do not have the internal processes to innovate at you know, in the first place. And if you look at the maturity of corporates that want to innovate, at first they have to create the internal processes for innovation. And then once they master those processes, they recognize that it is much cheaper and less risky to collaborate with fintechs instead of doing everything in the home, you know, creating your own uh, product teams that usually have to adhere to the bureaucracy of organization. And startups are lean and founders are not paying themselves fairly, so it's much a better deal to do it with outside. But uh, the general rule is that if it doesn't come from the CEO, from the top, top level, it's a very hard job for the people in the middle that were assigned, I don't know, from the marketing budget to do something with startups to look more innovative. So the banks are probably the slowest moving beast uh, we have here. And uh, potentially, our fintech startups will succeed not because of the banks, but uh, you know, without the banks. So I hope that the banks will catch up. Thank you so much, Danielus. And it's, uh, on, on that note, I just remember one of the trainings that we had when you're trying to deliver the message and basically what the startups are trying to do, to sell the idea to someone in the bank, not necessarily the decision maker, and then that person actually is the one that is trying to influence the whole army of the people around uh, him in the bank. And if there is no buy-in from top, then yes, of course, it's quite challenging. So I remember one of the advices I have been given, if you can't influence from Lithuania, change the messenger. 
not the message. The pitch might be good, the product might be good, everything could be very good. Change the messenger. And Alex probably could agree. There are some cultural differences that we're gonna come later to that, but Ilya wants to comment on that. Yes, go Yeah, ahead. yeah, we have a comment. So, uh, <laughs> they're very interesting, but when we work with banks, we're talking with uh, tens uh, of people, and usually maybe it's not very polite because we're in parallel con connecting with various uh, person, but it's very interesting that uh, very uh, rarely uh, we find that uh, our message collides at some at some at some level. So usually you uh, discuss this with uh, different people in the same bank, uh, even the same department, but they don't know about the message you deliver to a first person. So uh, that's why you need to try and to, to go to a different levels, different people, and uh, and so on and so on. So depending on the solution, there might be conflict of interest internally within the bank. I turned it off. Uh, actually, yeah, I agree with you. So, yeah, that's okay. the problem. Thank you so much, Ilya, for your comment. And now we're going to Ludas Canepianis. Ludas is wearing as well, or has been wearing, two hats um, as well. One, sitting on the other one side of the table and trying to sell the solution to the bank. And now, having the solution already implementing KYC solution. If you could introduce a little bit of the solution and your two different perspective being, uh, perspectives being on the different sides of the table. <clears throat> yeah, so um, maybe I will start just uh, with, with a bit of, let's see, story. Yeah. So I'm, I'm dealing with the banks uh, since 2012. Yeah, so, uh, and the easiness of the alliance actually within the bank, it actually depends on what you want uh, the bank to do. Because before, I was actually just asking the bank to kind of uh, deal with me uh, by taking the bank's infrastructure and then challenging the bank with the same infrastructure. Yeah, so, uh, so of course the alliance cannot be easy in this way, yeah, because you're kind of taking the part of that and then cutting the, the business uh, of, of the bank. And, uh, and when you actually have the kind of problem solving solution, so then of course it's totally, totally different. Yeah, so, uh, so I would say that the easiness itself, it actually depends on what you actually do and if you solve the problem or no. Because uh, the, the fintech in, in general is, is a really big word, you know, so, so uh, starting from the payments to some special solutions uh, delivered to, to the bank itself, yeah, so, so kind of building some financial technology. And uh, the bank itself is a, a actual, just a corporate doing the business. So if you're actually helping them to solve any kind of, at least a little problem, so they're really open doing that because they have a really, really big scale, you know, large customer base. And if you can solve some small question uh, with some, let's say, with all the user base by kind of, uh, I don't know, saving them one euro per customer, this will be a really big case for them and they will discuss that. If you want to just to come, you know, to say that, listen, uh, I need your payment infrastructure. I will send dollars through your accounts and all this stuff. Uh, you, you will not know my customers and all, the, all, the, all, the, all this stuff. So, of course, it, it, it will be not an easy alliance. Then you have to bring a really, really big business case. So, so that's, that's how I see that. So, basically, if I may just to summarize in what I understand, and please correct me if you understand the same. So, depending on the solution that as a startup I have, there are different interest points within the bank. So if I want to sell something beneficial for the bank that enhances the customer experience or within the bank processes, that's much easier because it's only low-hanging fruits. It's already visible, the benefit. But you are selling something where the head of innovations, Gediminas, is sitting on the branch and cutting the branch he's sitting on because he has to fire 50 people because the automated solution is actually conflicting with the, you know, Conflict of interest, isn't it, within the bank? So, Alex, I can see that you're raising your hand to comment on that. Yeah, I just wanted Thank to... Thank you, Ludas. I just wanted to compliment uh, what Ludas was saying there as well. And I remember in the last few years hearing startups coming to the bank and pitching ideas, but completely misunderstanding... <coughs> excuse me. Completely misunderstanding what that pain point is for the bank. And I think it's very easy for us to sit outside the banks and say, hey, this must be painful for the banks. I can solve it with my, my solution. But the reality is when people were going and talking to, to us in the bank at that time, uh, it was very, very, it, I mean, they just, there was a complete mismatch. 
So, so the kind of takeaway for the audience here is, you know, really try and do your homework and understand what are these pains that the bank is having, you know, not just what the clients of the banks are having. So, uh, and then I, you know, definitely agree with your point about not cutting off the branch that, uh, that the bank is sitting on. So basically, it's like the startup is giving the medicine for the patient, but you have to identify which part of the body is in pain. So if you're giving a headache painkillers for the someone responsible for the legs, not going to work. Is that correct, the analogy that I have used? Thank you, and Gideon yeah, would like yeah, this. Yeah, that's totally correct. Actually, it's everywhere in business. If you even a seller of whatever, you really need to understand what is the pain on the customer side. And then uh, really it will work really well. But if you just uh, sell some imaginary good for you, but maybe not that good for the bank, and if bank have some more choices to choose from, let's say one has a really uh, good business case, another one is kind of, maybe it's not competing, but it's also no uh, added value for the customer, then it's, um, of course, bank will prioritize the one that has much better uh, impact to the customer and also uh, impact also for income. And uh, about the slow decisions in the banks and uh, totally agree that uh, decisions could be faster. I would like to have them faster myself and also see really lots of different interests interest in the banks based on the areas they are working in and uh, and you know the more people are uh, the, the harder to get uh, consensus and, uh, and, and com uh, one, one decision. But uh, let's say um, that we did with IT development and uh, product development actually. Recently we had a, a big reorganization that we moving uh, to agile, but not only like IT works agile way, but also uh, 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 business product areas all together in same teams. So uh, IT development is not kind of IT, pure IT anymore. It's, uh, uh, agile teams working all together, business side with the uh, product owners, with the uh, business analysts, and so on. So it's part of one team. No blame game that you did, haven't done this or that, and so on. And they are focusing on the area that they are working in. So that's example in what is ongoing in IT, and it's already faster to develop something. But about decision making and uh, with uh, regarding partnerships and collaborations, new products, it's uh, it just uh, starting now and. Uh, and uh, we really need to develop some faster process and shortcuts inside the organization to, to, to make it faster. Because for startups, you know, decision even a month, it's, it's really a very long uh, time sometimes because they, okay, they, no, they don't want to wait. They want to go next and maybe someone else will, will, will agree and um, some other bank maybe will agree. Thank you, Gediminas. And Ludas, do you want to comment now? Yeah, I wanted to comment be a bit before, but uh, I will complement with that as well, because uh, for, for a startup to wait a month, it means that you burn uh, actually the monthly, you know, uh, uh, yeah, you're, you, you're low on the budget already by the month, yeah. Um, but uh, what was said before, actually, and the Alex point was really good. So, and, and uh, now it's a really good time to start the fintech startup with all the infrastructure that is actually going on, yeah? Because uh, with all these innovation centers and everything within the banks now, you're actually able to come to the bank and to ask what are the actual painful points. And, and basically that's the, just a straightforward process how doing that. With, with, with not thinking, you know, just in your company or something, or uh, sharing with each other with friends, but you can actually come to the bank and to ask what, what are your painful points. Yeah, what are your challenges? And yeah. then the Innovation Hub would uh, create a pipeline of the fintech startups to solve the challenges. Danielus, you had a comment. I, I've seen you raise yeah, it. Yeah, um, I'd like to challenge the assumption that, you know, the bank has to be all the, ultimately to be the client. So then the innovation department is more or less the procurement department. So, you know, somebody has said that, you know, you're, you're chopping your leg off for 50 people, but maybe it's faster to run with prosthetics. You know, and that's, that's why you have to have the head thinking of what is happening and actually co-creating innovation together with startups. But not, you, you don't have to necessarily think that the bank is the ultimate client. That's one way. But uh, I really hope that the banks look at fintechs as, uh, you know, magic pills. You don't know what will happen, but uh, try taking some. Thank you, Danielus. And this is a great moment to go to the culture. We don't do anything in our life what we don't want to do. 
Simple as that. So if I don't want to cut, I don't cut. If I don't want a prosthetics, I don't want a prosthetics. If I don't want to, I just want it to be a procurement innovation office. Well, innovation, a buzzword, but still just procurement. If I am afraid to change something in the company, if I'm afraid to be unpopular, or if I'm losing a little bit of the budget and my role is a little bit diminishing, and I am in the big political game, then maybe I don't want to do this. I just like the money that I get for that role. So, culture. What role culture is playing in alliances between the startups and corporations and banks? Yes, we do this. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. I think one of the reasons actually I left the same bank as Alex, as Alex did, so I left that six years ago, seven years already, Alex, two years ago, was actually that Scandinavians are very slow, indeed very slow, and they don't take a decision actually until they have consensus on all levels. And that, that sucks. <laughs> Thank you for so being that, honest. That was, that, that was the main actual reason. I don't know whether that changed. Maybe Alex can talk about that because he left the bank just recently, but when I left actually, so it, it was impossible to implement even some innovation inside the bank yourself. So, and I think the problem is not about timing or something. I think the, the other problem is that decisions are taken not here. They're taken in Stockholm, Copenhagen, Helsinki, and I can't imagine that somebody from Helsinki would allow somebody here in Vilnius to do something that they haven't tried themselves there. So it's, that, that's the problem, I guess. So there is a cultural thing of understanding the different cultures, accepting the innovation, being the adaptive, flexible, and sometimes maybe challenge your own attitude and perception, isn't it? So I see, uh, Ilya, you, you already got... Yeah, some... actually, you, you, you said what, what I wanted to compliment, that uh, actually, if we talk about Lithuania, uh, most of our banks are Scandinavian or, I mean, Nordic banks, and uh, headquarters are actually not here. So um, I completely agree that uh, usually uh, the decisions are making not here and uh, to talk here is usually uh, time wasting, let's say. So, but on the other hand, uh, when we talk that uh, Scandinavian ba banks are slow, it's not, uh, I mean, or it's not about Scandinavian, all, or all banks across the world are slow. So it's in DNA of, the, of this com type of company. Got it. Uh, and Gideon yeah. would like to challenge back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I don't want to agree that decisions uh, are made uh, like in some headquarters necessarily. And we have examples that we have solution uh, in Baltics, but there is no uh, such solution in Sweden. And there are many examples of that. And also the ones that with the partnerships with the third parties as well. For example, Airplay Books, our accounting system in, in uh, Internet Bank for SMEs is... Uh, is was first developed in in Baltics and 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 launched uh, last year and uh, just later on some alternative solution was was also uh, done in Sweden and um, and also we have different infrastructures actually maybe the bank is one but actually uh, uh, historically uh, Swedbank some ten years ago bought uh, Hansa Bank. And uh, our IT systems are quite different. In Baltics, it's pretty similar. It's nearly nearly same, but in Sweden, it's uh, very different. And uh, that's why, if we want to cooperate and do some uh, integration, uh, then uh, if it's worth considering uh, separately Sweden and separately Baltic countries. So it's not necessarily all in group wide. Okay, that's a very good comment. And Alex, you're raising. A yeah, I, I think uh, I've been very lucky to see the uh, the difference between uh, Scandinavian organisations working with the Baltics. I'm, I'm British, um, so being in the middle of, uh, of of both of those has been has been really fun to see. And for me, it really came, comes down to two things: uh, the Scandinavians love process, so it doesn't really matter what's the end result. It's about how you go on this journey, wherever you go. <laughs> People in the Baltics. I like this much more. It's all about the results. Let's be focused. Let's have an objective. Let's have a target. Let's have a result. Let's go that way. And these two cultures just don't match at all. The second part of that is about kind of the law and how we see the law. And uh, the Swedish side is very much what's the spirit of the law? How has this been written? What's the intention? 
In the Baltics, it's maybe much more, how is it exactly written? If it's not written that we can't do it, let's do it. <laughs> so there's, let's say, a little bit more creativity in what we actually uh, uh, can and can't do. But those are two pretty fundamental gaps between Scandinavian culture and Lithuanian and uh, the other Baltic states culture as well. Thank you, Alex, on that comment. And uh, as I was joking to some foreigners when we travel around the globe and, and sometimes we talk to them, I said, you know, Lithuanian DNA has itself you know, that flexibility and creativity, why we've been occupied by Russians, Germans, Polish, you name it, the country that haven't passed by Lithuania. And if they blink, they might miss us. So we were loud and, you know, very determined if, if we look from the DNA perspective of Lithuanian culture. So back to the culture. Danielus, from your experience on looking for 300 startups, it's quite a huge number, and your experience of consulting them, from the startup perspective, what cultural differences do you see comparing us Lithuanian startups globally, if you had any experience on that? Yeah, I spent some time in Silicon Valley with uh, Berkeley Skydeck Accelerators, so I saw startups there. Um, I think that uh, Lithuanian startups are great at execution, but not necessarily at planning. I think that uh, the time horizon that they're looking into is pretty short what we should do the next uh, week or two or three months or six months instead of uh, looking into how the picture will play out in five years if we do everything right. Of course, you know, it's like agile versus, uh, you know, strategic planning. But um, I, I think that uh, Lithuanians want to do everything by their own hands and therefore they can only imagine what they can achieve on their own. They do not expect any help from anyone, so they will suffer through and hopefully achieve the results. While in, in the rest of Europe or, or in Silicon Valley, it's more, you know, openness and trust and going out for help and advice. So I, I, I think there's a need for uh, you know, mixing the cultures a bit, but it will not happen unless we have more foreigners here or our startups go and work elsewhere. And w one last point I want to add is that we still don't have major startup success story. You know, it's all in progress. Uh, you know, even the biggest startups that we have today, you know, they haven't done the exit. You know, the, the, there are no, you know, 60, um, you know, new startups arising from one, one success story like in Estonia. So, and the point is that once you get the startup at that scale, then you have a lot of people who know how to build a startup, you, you, who know what process should be done and what stage of development, and then they can go and assemble a new team that would have the full knowledge. Now, we are learning on our own, and this is the slowest possible way to do it, uh, but Lithuanians are tough. Yeah, we are, and actually on the opening event of the FinTech Week on Monday, we had a panel discussion where only the men were, and the ambassador of Netherlands was in the audience, and she asked a question, why there is no women in, in, in diversity? And the question was in regards to diversity. So, yes, uh, as the culture, we don't ask for help. And uh, back to Gediminas uh, on sandbox uh, that you have open. I just read in the article that you had 50% of Swedish and only 10 to 12% of Lithuanians, which means again, do we have opportunities? Bank of Lithuania is quite open for the feedback. Investors are here, interested in staying and living in Lithuania. Um, startups, a great opportunity to create your startup and start developing and, and scaling it. But do we use all opportunities? So. Ludas, you would like to comment? Yeah, because uh, if just to extend this conversation, so uh, from the cultural side, what I would see is that the Lithuanians are actually lack of confidence. So uh, the investors will not like that, but you can see that on the, on the valuations they, they bring, uh, because these are actually too low, you know, two, three times lower than, the, than the, all the other startups in, in, in uh, outside, let's say, this region. So uh, I think that, that that's the main problem, uh, just the lack of self-confidence and uh, understand that, that we could actually do that, you know, that we could actually approach them or something because people in Lithuania are thinking that, you know, they will not like that or they will not do that or something just uh, without trying it. So, so that's 
that's how I see that. There is a lot of hesitation, but one thing that comes up to my mind in the Netherlands, the AB Amro Bank, uh, well, corporate venture capital um, representative, he, Hugo, he has mentioned it. I asked him a question, how do you choose? He's scouting for the startups. I said, how do you choose which one? If especially it doesn't have a good entrepreneurship record. He said, I look at the team and I check the record about what did they do, what is their good repute, what are the feedbacks, and I basically approach two, three people that they know. I check the network on the team if I can trust them. And I, I wouldn't think that that's the first criteria, but what, that was the first one that he has mentioned it. Then I was thinking, going back to Lithuania, okay, how many years do we have uh, of independence? 22. So what is the longest track record of the entrepreneurship comparing to other countries? So it's quite challenging, isn't it, to be confident, having great idea, um, quite nice PowerPoint designed, and facing people with vast experience of investment. Yeah, but here the Estonia could be a good example because they don't have anything but basically shouting loud. So, so, so that's, that's yes. the approach. And actually, I just uh, read on the internet that the Global Innovation Index for 2018 has ranked Lithuania number 40, after Latvia number 32, uh, 34, and Estonia number 40, uh, 24. So, well, we think that Estonians are shy. We have that biases that, you know, they are slow and shy. But actually, look at them. They are much better at communication, isn't it, than pro promoting? At, at marketing, actually, yeah. Yes. Gediminas, would you like to add something? Or, or shall we go to the questions, Q&A? Yeah, you mentioned also about sandbox and the statistics there. But actually, I want to say that this sandbox that you can, uh, you can uh, use and try out, it's actually based on PSD2, and it's kind of uh, basic functionality there. But uh, what Swedbank is looking for also to build premium APIs that we can, uh, we can cooperate. We, ca we don't need to open that for everyone, but with some special cooperation uh, agreements, we can, we can go further beyond PSD2. APIs. So sandbox for APIs and PSD2, but you have two accelerator programs, actually one ah, second yeah. one you just launched on 6th of September. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in Rise Vilnius. Uh, yeah, actually we have accelerator program uh, in Riga that uh, we were running now second round and um, there were around 20 candidates selected by startup wise guys out of uh, 150 or 200 and um, and um, How I many was in an event that selection, sorry? How many Lithuanians? Actually, they were good that this time it was three companies from Lithuania as well, but in the pre uh, first iteration that it was in spring, it was uh, 15 companies selected and no one from Lithuania at all. And now we had three companies, that was really great to hear. And, uh, and uh, we had a selection event, I think it's some three weeks ago in Riga, and, uh, and uh, uh, we, uh, planning to, to work with uh, 10 out of uh, those 20 uh, for three months. And uh, uh, we also looking into, if we decide on cooperation later on with them, we're also looking into investments. So it's not only about cooperation, but in case we cooperate, we also uh, check this investment possibilities as well. All right, thank you so much. Alex, you would like to say something, yeah, sure. Yeah, just, just one. One more um, uh, comment on this on this topic of culture and, and what else we can do, I think, to strengthen what we're doing in Lithuania. And, and the, the kind of the key word there is cooperation. I think so many times I've seen, you know, two or three startups in Lithuania at a very, very early stage trying to do exactly the same thing. And if we could take a leap a little bit beyond maybe our own, our own houses, it, shelters, whatever it is, and actually reach out and say, hey, let's do this together, let's cooperate, let's work. I think that's also something that can have an enormous lift for, for startups in Lithuania. Thank you very much, Alex. That's basically what Danielus um, have mentioned, that we just, and Ludas as well, uh, on, we're very tough, it's better to suffer than to cooperate. That's okay. So has that been useful? Audience, wave, clap, give a sign. Yes? All right. Now the Q&A session. Any questions from the audience? I know Sharuna is holding this square, beautiful microphone. Don't be afraid. She can throw it at you. Just, yes, Linus. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Talk to the... A big one. Yes, the big one. The big one. Beautiful one. Good. My question is, uh, uh, in your opinion, uh, am, I, am, I, am I right by impression that only a few banks have to look like in the world and... Uh, 
are doing this cooperation with startups due to the fact that they see an opportunity. It seems to me subjectively that, me, that majority and especially finance bear um, are doing more like for the fact that they feel some kind of a danger that, okay, I should be in that, in that cooperation, otherwise, well, startups are fast, they, they, they might really at some point, you know, eat my revenue and et cetera, so, you know, let's better cooperate with those guys in order to confront with them. But, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, what is your opinion, really? Are, are banks more cooperating due to the opportunity or due to the fact that they do not want, you know, to be consumed uh, or how to call it? So to the danger. Thank you. So basically, yeah. to lose or to gain? Yeah, to lose or to gain. Okay. Yeah, uh, you Thank know, you. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's actually, you know, in order to, to uh, provide the really good services uh, for the customers, a uh, bank has opportunity to be a platform, a platform for various financial services and nearby uh, services that are related with finances. And actually, by saying platform, I mean that lots of various solutions could be from one side as a third party providers uh, as a part of platform in the bank and another side is customers so we can connect uh, solutions with uh, a big amount of uh, customers so and uh, usually each platform has benefit the more players in the platform the more customers in the platforms the better for both for all parties so if you take uh, whatever platform, if you take, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, Alibaba, yeah, the more sellers, the more buyers. Uh, a Facebook as a platform, the more users are, the better for each user there. Also, you take uh, Android, the iOS ecosystem, the more uh, users are, the more developers will develop applications and vice versa. So here's also same principle, the more, uh, users also demand more services. They want something new, something cool, and for them it's really good when everything is integrated, it's not, not needed to go somewhere else. You have everything in one place and you can, you can utilize whatever fintech services uh, you have uh, in supply. So it's, it's much more convenient uh, to have uh, everything in one place than to be scattered around and to have many apps instead of one that you can have all integrated solutions. So in summary, the bank is ready to lose something, to gain something and to scale it and have an impact, first of all, on the customer journey and on this healthy competition where that allows to grow and develop better products. All right. Yeah. The, has that answered your question? Yeah. All right. Any other questions in the back, Sharuna? That's all the way in the back. Don't be afraid, it's quite soft, the microphone itself. Okay. Good evening. So uh, yes, just hold it a bit closer. Okay, yeah, cool. thank you. Good evening, well, thanks for the discussion. My question would be, would you advise startups to focus more on solutions for your internal processes as a bank? or uh, it's better to come up with uh, like solutions to the problems of the customers? Uh, what is the key focus? What is the area for, co for collaboration? So if I may repeat the question, the question is, are the banks are more fo focusing on the fintech startups that customer oriented or more internal process oriented? Is that correct? Have yes, I summarized that, that correct? Yes, that's that was the question. All right, thank you. Getting yeah, us probably uh, question to you. Actually, both things are interesting, but uh, my focus is, of course, customer experience and all that part that uh, relates to the customer and to, to build a platform for them. So, uh, but generally, of course, bank wants to be efficient and also these things are also important, but it's then another, some other people are dealing with that. And uh, just to add to that question, we had an opening event and the Elthic, the Global Innovation Director from Barclays, he had a presentation and overview on the fintech startups globally, because RISE, as you know, has a global network. And one of the things he has mentioned it, or that was my takeaway, that most of the fintech startups, they are talking or more focused on technology itself than the benefit for the end user or customer in this case. So what his um, advice was, always talk, and the microphone's are feeding, and always think what is the end user gaining out of your technology. 
we're very good at describing this is the blockchain, this is that and that and that, and this is the platform and infrastructure and compatibility requirements, but then in the end, what's my benefit? What is the benefit? So, as we always, and Ilya, your experience of talking to the banks, yes. Yeah, uh, a bit from my experience. Uh, actually, I agree with Gediminas about that, that both are interesting, but uh, you need to understand uh, um, that when you are uh, fixing some needs in the bank, it's, it's, it is much easier to sell within the bank uh, rather than customer experience, because customer experience is very hard to evaluate to allocate budget for that and uh, calculate, calculate ROI. Uh, while in internal needs, when you cut some costs, it's very easy. So that's it. Yeah, if you do, you build cost and benefit analysis, it's of course, it's each much easier, much easier as Elia has mentioned it. Any other questions from the audience? And Alex, you would like, you, you wanted to comment on something, no? Uh, not a comment on that, but uh, I have one final question for the audience. So oh, no, not yet final, if, you, not, if not, that's not okay. Yet. Don't go anywhere yet, okay? Uh, any other questions? Yes. Sharuna, if I may ask your help. I know you're in two roles today, so thank you so much. And um, for uh, Camille yeah, and Sharuna. I have a question today. for Gideminas. You talked about the differences between core systems in uh, Sweden and the Baltics. So first question would be, is your sandbox uh, restricted to Lithuania only, or is it uh, also open to other Baltic organizations? So if you have success in Lithuania, will the same solution in integration would apply to Latvia and Estonia systems? Yeah, actually a very good question. And the sandbox solution is like uh, group-wide, it's the same for all countries. And actually, we, as far as we know, we are the only one of the banks in the market that is going to go with one API for all four markets. So it will be the same. Like if we pilot for one country, then totally same API will be for other countries. Okay, infrastructure behind connecting Sweden and Baltics is different, and we want to hide that complexity from startups, and we want to 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 have them uh, to to help them with integration to have it much more convenient. So one API for all four markets. And I know that you have some startups from New Zealand as well applying for your sandbox API. Yeah, it was also from New Zealand, Australia, so it's really sometimes exotic. And uh, I heard also from, from Monday, I heard a discussion that uh, there are some startups coming also from uh, opposite side of the world. Uh, world. So, so that's really interesting that they did their homework and they are coming uh, to, to enter EU market through Lithuania. And uh, have you... At any Just on, on, on that note, we had a uh, Korean uh, delegation and Japanese delegation, and uh, us, uh, well, we have Brexit, but Lithuania uh, started calling us the Singapore to Europe, because we become quite an attractive point as gateway to Europe for different uh, markets, and Korean delegation, Japanese, they said we would like to have a collaboration with the fintechs in Lithuania, which was really interesting, not only to invest, but to have as I'm saying, two layers. One is the pipeline on the fintechs, and other one is the pipeline of investors, and then the common ground to meet somewhere. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I'm running uh, just uh, innovation, retail innovation conference yearly, and it's quite interesting to see how evolving uh, problems, uh, which was, let's say, last year, and what would be, let's say, next year. When my question would be, <coughs> Could you name the main pains for banks, what it's necessary to solve, and what could be solved cre cre creatively by startups, for example, for, from today's perspective? Okay, so if I may rephrase, because in the back you couldn't hear the question, isn't it? You couldn't. Okay, if I may summarize. So the question was that um, the problems are evolving and changing throughout the years, if I understood correctly. And the question is to the bank, what are the business challenges, five pain points that business has now that startups could help to solve yeah. you? Yeah, actually, I will not answer those five points now because I'm meeting with different people inside the organization and different department has really different pains and different things. And, 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 uh, and even after collecting all these, we need to really gather and prioritize what is most important on overall level because, you know, again, lots of interests. So each, each uh, department, uh, each department, 
you know, it's most important for themselves and <laughs> and and um, uh, we we will run this on quite a high level to, to prioritize uh, what is demand for us and then we'll see the market what is supply and we will see where demand and supply matches. It could be that something that we need non-existent in the market, it could be that so many things exist in the market that we don't actually need, it's not our priority. So maybe uh, we will start with the demand and supply match points. Probably to make an impact assessment of the things that the bank is not aware that they are in the market might be quite challenging for the bank itself. So that's another opportunity to start asking and collaborating, okay, what it is, and matching the how you're going to do the benefit analysis if, if we don't know what it is. As uh, Steve Jobs said, we're not going to do the market research because the customers not, don't know yet what they want. I'm going to create a product that they're going to line up over the night to get it. And that's what happened. Yeah, that's right. I totally agree with you. It could be that uh, some company pop up that we haven't uh, heard about before and then if we see it, it's a great idea. It could be re-prioritized, of course. It's so, but preliminary, if we, before going to hunt for, for startups that that we could uh, do some integrations. We need to really clarify ourselves. What do we really need? What are the most painful areas? Uh, and on the uh, whole company perspective. Thank you so much. And to answer the question about the pain points from Barclays' perspective, we do have them. And it's, uh, there is no, no secret about that, that we have a lot of data. And the data becomes legacy and becomes cost instead of creating value out of it. So one of them that pops up to my mind at the moment, but we do have a list of it, of course. Okay, any other questions? Thank you for the questions. Any other? Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, I don't know this event will be about uh, serv uh, services which we can offer to bank. I thought it's in general about startups and banks because there are a lot of topics uh, like uh, banks work so hard to, uh, to make sure that startups don't, don't do mistakes, but they miss uh, uh, like money laundering in, uh, who, who, which is done by large companies, uh, but yet we uh, are so strict and even uh, propose to use sandboxes for uh, uh, startups. I think, and also uh, uh, bank regulations in general. I mean, some banks are very f flexible s in the say in U European Union, and some are very strict. And it's like uh, I see the most unpredictable thing is when uh, you run a startup and one day it might close your account, especially if you work with like uh, blockchain technology, right? Uh, uh, is there anything, any progress in that area? I mean, uh, uh, will it be, will you, uh, what, what's, what I see, what is needed is like some uh, more publicity about what's, what's okay to do, what's not okay, uh, because sandbox, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's gonna solve this, uh, in general. So do I, do I understand correctly, and I'm going to rephrase if I made a question for the people in the back. So basically there are things happening uh, and the banks, they have challenges, but it's not yet clear what are the challenges and how do they want us as a startups to tackle them? Uh, basically pretty much the question would be uh, what steps a uh, bank uh, makes uh, uh, to be more startup friendly so uh, the startups with their little budgets don't get risk uh, to, to so their accounts are frozen if they did uh, uh, some some little mistake you know because okay. right now i see the startups get a lot more attention than the large uh, companies so uh, what is the variance of the failure? How much do we allow the startups to failure? Is that, yes. is that the question? Is that to Gediminas, Ludas, uh, who would? Well, just, uh, who would like to pick up that question? Vito, I'll just yes. start maybe. I think two weeks ago, a week ago, we had like a meeting together, the first one between the banks, electronic money institutions, and the payment institutions, not the public one, because Banks were blaming electronic 
money institutions and payment institutions that they pose too much risks, uh, and vice versa. Payment institutions were blaming banks that they just ignore them or just, I don't know, impose requirements that you cannot meet. Actually, we had that meeting, and I actually expected a very hard discussion, actually a lot of blood, so to say. And everyone was so polite, and so bo it was so boring, I would say. <laughs> I, d I don't know, so it's, I'm not pretty sure how the problem is, or at least we try to identify that, but th there, are, there are some issues, and we try just to, to figure out actually what are the main problems, or the main areas we should try to moderate between the bank and the banks and the payment institutions. And I agree, there are issues to be solved. There are issues to resolve, but if you would like to impress the fintechs or investors abroad, just tell them how quickly the e-money license can be issued in Lithuania by the Bank of Lithuania, and they all being silent for three to two seconds. Yeah, I think generally that is done, we, ha we have that statistics we follow, we generally do that in like 90 or 100 days, that's calendar days. And I think in some cases, it's a very, very well-known company worldwide. So we, we will do that. I wouldn't say that's, that's two weeks. Okay, okay, got it. So it's still very quick comparing to 12 months across the Europe, most more or less. There was a question, you raised the hand. Yep. Uh, if I may. Yeah, Dash sure. Lepauskas, former central bank and our freelance consultant uh, advising uh, the challenger banks. Uh, I'm just looking now, right now at uh, uh, financial and, and fi uh, financial services. Could you please hold the oh, microphone sorry. a little bit closer? Financial I know that is a lot of... In Latvia page uh, where they have uh, a nice list of uh, commercial banks and along the names and, uh, and contact uh, information, they also uh, list the sanctions which were applied by the regulator to each particular institution. What's interesting that in this list there are 15 banks and only two of them, they, uh, they haven't suffered a financial fine from a regulator. And by the way, the Swed Bank shines uh, with uh, 1.3 million of uh, financial fine for anti-money uh, 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 anti, uh, uh, anti laundering uh, regulation breaches. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I actually, I'm not pointing to, uh, to, uh, to Latvia, to, to, to our uh, nice friends and colleagues. Uh, I think that situation is pretty, mu pretty much the same across the globe. And uh, actually, we'll, we'll find uh, uh, very similar examples in, even in our own market. So my question is, uh, uh, why is it so? Is it uh, the, the, the banking is sort of uh, most criminal, uh, criminalized uh, professional community? Or is something wrong with regulation? Is it something uh, what uh, we are uh, probably uh, 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 overdid over the, over the past uh, year? At most important, uh, 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 past years. Most importantly, what can we do to solve this? Because I presume that uh, banks and financial market participants they do not do intentionally. It's probably a matter of misunderstanding, which is probably the result of principles-based regulation than the rule-based regulation. If I, so, may, mm -hmm. if I may summarize, because that's quite a long, um, three points that I picked up. One is there is a list of the banks that they got fined for one or, or other regulation breach. Another thing is, so why it's happening? Are they criminals? So what's going on? Or maybe the question is, are the regulations changing so quickly and so many changes at the same time that it's quite challenging to pick up on all of them. And the third question was, what can we do to tackle that? Is that correct? Yep, thank you. Who would like to pick up that one? It's quite a challenging thing. Vito Tez, question to you probably, from the regulatory perspective. Do you think we have, what's happening? Why do the banks get fined so often? Are we making too many audits, and now it's kind of obvious that they have been doing that before, but now it becomes obvious and visible, or what, what's going on? Is it publicity? I think it's, first of all, it's like greedy bankers, I would say. That's definitely what drives them, big bonuses. 
And no surprise when they manipulate LIBOR or something, or they, I don't know, they transfer hundreds of millions of Sinola cartel money, drug cartel money around the globe. Th there's, there's no, no issue about that. So, and I think we look at the principles, if, if we would find actually, it, it, in every case we see actually a breach of some regulation, so we don't have resources for that. So I think we just try to talk. Sometimes we try to give an example, a public example, so the others don't do that. But I wouldn't agree that in most cases it's unintentional. I hear it every time we sanction somebody every second week. So we did it unintentionally and we regret doing that. We won't be doing that. Unintentionally you sanction every week, two, every, every second, second week someone. More or less. Uh, with uh, 120 people working at the Bank of Lithuania, that they are busy with building the strategy of the regulation and as well auditing and sanctioning someone. Yeah, I think, I think recently we, we made like a, a record high fine for breaches of IML requirements in Lithuania. That was like in total above 1 million euros just for the electronic money institution. Okay, it's, it's high, but... It, it was a complete mess, actually, and we sent a single to the other payment institutions. Okay, we don't tolerate that risk at all. So better you just put enough resources and attention to that because we don't have our own resources to come to every institution and to, ch to check that. So it's better to find one and just show the others than to go to every, everybody, check everybody, and just to find everyone. We cannot oh. do that. Got it. So sometimes you're gaining and sometimes you're losing. So as the Lithuania back to the culture, we want to be famous for the good things, probably not such uh, for the biggest fines in Europe. I see the question in the back and it's probably going to be the last one because I'm conscious of time. It's five minutes past eight. So last question, then Alex has a question to the audience. And then if there are any outstanding comments or advices for better collaboration alliances between the banks and startups please share and do that before we go so yes so yeah actually i wanted to follow up on that last comment from vitotas so it sounds like cent uh, the central bank is lacking resources and the way like you work is can be also improved so is the central bank open to cooperate with fintechs and startups yes we do that we'll always look for for the opportunities and I think we talked with a colleague and he will present his IML solution to my colleagues so we al already agreed about that bef before this meeting so we are fine and of course we have limited resources nobody has unlimited resources so we have just to base our supervision with risk-based principles so we go where, the, where there is the highest risk I would say so Ludas Kanapinis, just to, to comment on that and add, Ludas Kanapinis has an AML, KYC, know your customer um, um, technology, correct? Like a thin pass, is that? Solution, let's see, thank you. Solution, it's 8 p.m., I'm just getting, mixing all the words now, Lithuanian and English. I, I, yes, I also want to ask, actually, we, we really say that we are lacking resources currently and uh, we still try to attract more and more fintechs. So it means more and more monitoring and control will be needed. So how about that? Do you plan resources in that area as well? Just to be ready for big amount of fintechs and big, uh, bigger need of uh, controlling. And when? So ML, we know. KYC and so on. Yeah. What is the plan? I think what we try to, to do so we cannot attract more FTEs or to hire more people actually uh, whenever the market grows. So what we try to do, so we try to look at rec tech, so-called regulation, te regulation technologies, buying new solutions for analyzing data, better collecting the data. So we are looking into that. I think the last two years we spent on actually looking at into regulation and just making it more attractive as a jurisdiction. And I think the coming next two years will be just more devoted to our internal processes and involving more IT solutions into our process. Thank you very much, Vitutas. And, and uh, last 
question. I have the last question oh. <laughs> from the back. So we've heard the stories that startups are knocking on banks' doors and trying to sell the ideas. How, how often proactively banks are searching for the ideas and they are like scouting for the startups to work with from the bank's perspective. Because when uh, accelerators are open, they go around the region and then try to look for the best ones. So just could you comment on that? Probably that's for getting in us. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, one thing is, yeah, as you mentioned, already accelerator. So we do two cycles a year and usually we choose, okay, usually it's hard to say yet, but from first cycle we selected two uh, startups to, to cooperate with. And uh, we expect uh, actually from one to two out of ten to be successful to, to proceed cooperation later on. Uh, um, so, but those companies that are brought to Accelerator are not necessarily uh, 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 recruit, uh, how to say, selected based on our pain points. Actually, they were kind of whatever innovative, cool stuff that could be really uh, good for the customer. So uh, it's, it's not uh, based on our pain on, or let's say, uh, demand. Uh, but uh, on the, uh, regarding demand, uh, we are, uh, as I previously mentioned now, really uh, trying to set uh, priorities in between uh, various departments and uh, what would be priority for the bank. Actually, we, uh, our open banking team uh, spends a lot of time with the developing of APIs that are PSD2, uh, needed for PSD2 for compliance reasons. So it's also limited amount of resources that could uh, later on do those premium APIs and other things. So first of all, we need to really have a, uh, how to say, uh, 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 aligned focus? approach and yeah, prioritized approach. So, so and then we will go for hunting when we know clearly what is top five demand need. Yeah, that's what exactly the, the, the most of the conferences, they say, stay focused and know what you want. Because if you don't know what you want, it's quite challenging to find something that you like. Alex, your question to the audience? Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, Renata asked at the start, how many of you are from, the, uh, from banks today? And I was very pleasantly surprised to see so many people from the banks here. Um, and uh, my question is uh, for you, if, if you are interested or thinking about moving into fintech or possibly thinking about leaving the bank, I'm not going to embarrass you now and ask you to put up your hand. Please uh, find me on LinkedIn and uh, drop me a line <laughs> and it would be very interesting. Woo! I'm always, uh, always looking for new talent. Okay, so Alex just started a very good line. So, Gideminas, any promotions, anything you would like to get from the audience as well? Anything you can offer to the audience? Great, yeah, I like that. Yeah, like a, you know, idea I, market. Uh, uh, colleagues around me uh, already mentioned that they left SCB, you know, the bank, and actually I also left SCB. I, I, I thought I, you were announcing that I, you're leaving Swedbank. 18 years ago, I left SCB as well. So actually, Swedbank is really a good place to work. So, uh, so, uh, and uh, my proof is that I am here working here for 17 years and uh, many different positions. So it's always really fun and to find some something new what is really interesting for you. So Gideminas, are you looking for any talents to recruit? Uh, do you have any challenges who would like to promote a whatever, something? Uh, you know, we are searching constantly for, for, for many various professionals and, and also uh, juniors as well. So it's very general actually. It's like based on your uh, recruitment <laughs> part. But okay, uh, talking about cooperation, so uh, stay tuned. As you say in the conferences, we will come. So after we we really know about our demand, but it doesn't mean that you cannot come to us now. And if you really believe in your idea and if you are in a quite a major stage already, it's not like oh I have an idea and uh, maybe let's do and uh, and and it will take half a year or a year to do. So maybe it's too early to come, but maybe worth coming to check the idea would be really interesting. But but generally uh, we also evaluate our partners and. Uh, we don't want to, uh, like to start a business like with one or two person company that you know today exists and the uh, customers try start to use that service and uh, uh, after after some period of time that it, uh, it really disappears so it should be a sustainable solution that sustainable company and, uh, and 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 we see really way forward for cooperation thank you vito does anything you would like to promote ask or or advise as I said at the beginning, so 
I'm like in the bad guy and a good guy. And sometimes actually I hear from people around that they are afraid to contact us, I don't know, to write an email, to ask for a meeting or something, or for a presentation as a colleague. So don't be afraid to approach us. All right, thank you. And Ilya, anything we can help you with, or you can help us with? Uh, I didn't left the CB. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but actually, yeah, so I'm working in, a, in a many areas and uh, as an entrepreneur and as like an angel and a mentor. So if you are you're looking for some, some, some questions uh, regarding that, so feel free to contact. I'm always open to, for new meetings, new talks, and uh, uh, you never know what may happen. Mentorship. All right. Thank you so much, Ilya. Danielius. I'd like to say that I'm very positively surprised uh, by this discussion and actually the regulator. Because I think it's a very balanced view on the market that uh, banks are evil, non-compliant and being fined. Yet uh, sandboxes are created for startups to challenge those banks that uh, maybe will not be here in uh, 10 or 20 years. So I think today's uh, the balance of powers is different, but what will it be in 10 or 20 years, we do not yet know. And I'm proud to be from Lithuania, where other fintech startups are flocking to, and I hope that we can sustain this uh, ecosystem here and really have a thriving fintech um, ecosystem, and hopefully some of the local banks originating from Lithuania. Thank you so much, Danielis. And to this. Yeah, I'll finish with some positive, uh, let's say, feedback from, from this conference. So, uh, it was already said, so basically the, the, the time actually to do something now is, is really the best time uh, doing that. Just uh, the, the main thing is uh, that you always have to keep in mind that this has to be a win-win situation. Yeah? So there's, there has to be a value behind the anything, solutions or... Uh, or something you do and then the products and everything. So either to the process, either to the customers, either to the bank as the institution. So, so that's, that's the main target you have to chase for. And everything else, it will be done. Thank you so much. On that note, don't go anywhere. I would like to invite you tomorrow for the future of payment session in the evening. And then on Friday at 4 p.m. we have our closing event with the music and more different dynamics of the FinTech Week in Lithuania. Thank you, audience, for coming up and, and for the good questions. And we welcome you back tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And visit our ICE page on Facebook for the speakers and panelists. Thank you so much for spending your precious time here. We have have some gifts with our partner taste map that you can smell the coffee from far away it was freshly grinded just for you Sharuna thank you so much for help organizing a big big round of applause for our panelists thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your evening <laughs>